Hi, this is Dan Jones with Light Reading uh, for Orb TV. I'm here with Brian Deutsch, who is the CEO of Pivotal Comware. Hi, Brian. Hi, how are you, Dan? Good, how are you? Oh, very good to meet you. And uh, we're here at Mobile World Congress. I thought you might want to tell us a little bit about your startup before we get into the, uh, the technology of it. I'd love to, I'd love to. So Pivotal Comware is built on a foundation of breakthrough technology that we've created called holographic beamforming. And what it essentially allows us to do is harness and shape and control radio frequency waves. And in essence, build software-defined antennas. Mm -hmm. And these antennas, as opposed to legacy systems like Massive MIMO, like Phased Array, uh, those types of systems, uh, we have advantages in terms of cost and size and weight and power consumption and the ability to conform our antennas to different oddly shaped surfaces, fuselage of a plane. Uh, perhaps street furniture for a small cell deployment. Okay, so are there real specific uh, definitional differences between what you're doing and Massive MIMO? Because a lot of people have only really just heard of Massive MIMO. It's absolutely, uh, without question. So first off, this what you'll notice, this is actually an example of 39 gigahertz of uh, one of our arrays. And uh, what's interesting is that this entire antenna array is powered, could easily be powered off the USB port in your laptop. Mm -hmm. So less than 10 watts of power. Right. You'll see many manifestations of both phased arrays and massive multi-user MIMO systems that are of the 600 watt version um, here. So again, that size, that weight, that heat dissipation, that cost, um, those are all things that can, can cause a lot of issues when in terms of deployment um, citywide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what stage are you at with this technology? Can you go into trials with carriers? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I, would, I would want to point out also, and I think that was the question you were also asking, why is it called holographic beamforming? Yeah, yeah. And what's the difference uh, in a more discrete format? It's called holographic beamforming because the art and science behind this is very much like that of optical holograms. So, uh, you know, if you saw Star Wars and R2-D2 would project images, uh, holographic images, mm -hmm. that was a reference wave coming through a hologram and that caused this object wave to form. Well, we looked at that and we said, well, wait a second, radio waves are electromagnetic waves just like light waves are. So why can't we do the same thing with radio waves and make a surface that to a radio wave looks like a hologram, looks like a holographic plate. Mm -hmm. And then we can project beams wherever we need to project them into the ether. And that's what we've done, we've created. And that's why the holographic beam forming fits. It's a lot of the same mathematics behind it. Uh, the implementation is obviously a lot different than in, in the optics realm, but uh, you know, it works out uh, you know, really well for us to be able to again, harness and control those in a very discreet fashion. Cool, so 5G's only hope, maybe. I think so, that's actually uh, fascinating because you, um, what we found out is when, uh, you know, the FCC back in the States came out and said that 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz were gonna be in play as millimeter wave spectrum for 5G, um, you know, propagation's a real issue. You have yeah. a situation where just pushing that wave through space is gonna require you to focus that energy in order to just burn it through space and get it from one point to the next. Well, that's fine, that's hard enough. Now try to get it through this glass. Now yeah, try to yeah. get it through two planes of this glass. Now try to get it through two panes of this glass that's our low, uh, low emissions yeah. glass that have silver halides and things mm -hmm. like that impregnated in them. And now you have difficulty of the fact that you're hitting it from an oblique angle. So most of the energy is gonna reflect. And then you have a situation where the energy that doesn't reflect has to make its way through that gauntlet into a subscriber. So if you have something lightweight like this, which again requires almost no power, that can stuck, stick on that glass and then search, grab, and retransmit that signal back into the house, now you have something that can improve your uh, link budget, mm -hmm. sometimes by uh, orders of magnitude, 40, 50 decibel levels of improvement. So what does that mean for a real user and for a carrier? For a carrier it means Rather than having one base station serve 10 houses, it's one base station serving 30, 40, 50 houses. Right, right. And then what does it mean to the end user is that instead of having throughputs in the, you know, uh, using 64 QAM or 16, or I'm sorry, 16 QAM or 8, 8 PSK, you're gonna be able to do 64 QAM, 256 QAM. So for an end, end user, you're gonna have that capability of getting those gigabit speeds 
which the carriers want in order to compete with more traditional um, you know, vectors into the home. Sure. So that's addressing some of the challenges of 5G, but th does that also open up some new use cases? That's right. There is. Uh, this, actually what I'm looking at here is uh, at 39 gigahertz, is the antenna part of a um, backhaul unit for small cells, or actually a front haul unit for small cells. A lot of carriers went in all in, they pushed all their chips in on what we call cloud RAN or CRAN, and uh, where they separated the radio head and the baseband unit. And the baseband unit lives in a cloud, it's virtualized, and it needs dark fiber to run from one to the other. So a lot of carriers ran a lot of dark, dark fiber. What are the odds though that the small cell that they want to put on a street pole is actually on that dark fiber? Mm -hmm. So maybe they have 100, maybe 200, maybe 1,000 feet between the dark fiber. And there are situations in New York, Seattle, Austin, and back in the States, and I'm sure in London and other places around the world where trying to just permit to cut the street to get that fiber laid 100 feet, 200 feet is a three-year process. And then even if you can do that, in places like New York City, it's $500 a foot to yeah. lay fiber. Yeah. So what we've done is we've actually taken some of this millimeter wave spectrum, which is copious, they have mm. a lot of it, and we've had the ability to actually put this onto a dark fiber pole, and then it has purview to multiple small cells. And as the small cells come up, we can actually find them and light them up and use native CIPRI to actually feed them right. uh, at gigabit speeds. Okay. Another one, uh, which by the way, we've trialed some of these. This is an actual product that we're building for a carrier in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, when you have manifestations of things like um, uh, uh, small cells, uh, you have intercell interference, right? So you have a situation where one cell and the other, you're at the edge of that small cell. And you know, ca carriers generally like to design these systems so that they put those in dead zones where nobody's at. Well, in an urban situation, an urban uh, you know, environment, there is no such thing as a dead zone anymore. People peer and disappear constantly. So if all of a sudden a gathering of 1,000 or 2,000 people with social media and press are, is happening in a place that's in a cell edge, the car it's, it's gonna crumble, the system's crumbling. Well, what if we, could actually r dynamically redesign those cell structures on the fly. So we get key performance indicators back from the, from the carriers, and what we do is we actually cloud-base these beams. So the beams aren't in the antenna. The beams are on the other side in a cloud. Hmm. And we launch these beams as a service to the carriers. So add some machine learning, add some, maybe even some AI, and then you're actually able to achieve that, that, that true uh, uh, dream of self-optimizing a network, self-healing a network, which you've never really been able to do before. We've talked about it before, mm -hmm. but the ability to take those users who are now in a cell edge and all of a sudden move the cell edge, put it someplace else, put it someplace where there's no users and physically move that. That's something that nobody's ever been able to do before. Um, and follow usage patterns and traffic. What if you had a, uh, you know, something that looked like this LCD TV that was on the side of a building and uh, in an urban canyon? In urban canyons, it's real difficult to get down to the street, yep. right? So you have a situation where if you had that antenna in the morning, it could actually be set up to actually have a bow tie beam shoot out from it so it covers all the pedestrian tr and car traffic until about 9 a.m. And then if people are in the buildings, it can come up and actually light those up right. and then back down to the street level at 4 p.m. And then if there's a special uh, you know, assembly protest ceremony, it can actually go and reposition or a soccer match or you know, those yep. types of things. Cool. Well, this sounds like a technology to watch. Absolutely. Thank yes, you sir. so much for talking to us. Dan, thanks for your time. Thanks very okay, much. I appreciate it. This has been Dan Jones uh, from Light Reading for Orb TV.